Good morning. Today we'll read from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. praise and honor. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son to die for our sins. We thank you that you cast those sins as far as the east is from the west because we are your children, children of the Most High. We are new creations in Christ Jesus, Lord. Help us to remember that. Help us to be filled with your spirit, to follow your, your word, Lord, in the spirit and guide us into all truth. Lord, we pray that today as we listen to your word, continue through Luke's gospel. Lord, we thank you for that we have the Bible so freely for us in so many different ways and commentaries and everything else that we take for granted, Lord. Help us to feed on the Word as much as we feed on the food that we do for, for our physical substance, O oh Lord. And we just thank you and praise you for the mighty works that you do, Father, even though we don't even have the comprehension to understand all of them. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've entitled this With or Against... And with that with or against, I mean, you can think right off if you're following the passages at all that we're either with or against Jesus. That also implies that we are with or against Satan, does it not? Because that's the opposing force there. And that also implies that we're gathering or scattering. scattering. Are you, what are you doing in your life? If you are held accountable today for your life, what would you say when you meet Jesus face to face? What are the things that are most important to you? What are the loves that you have? How are you living out this new creation that you have in Christ Jesus where you're seated already in the heavenly realms? There is no middle ground. Middle ground, that means an area of compromise or possible agreement midway between two extreme positions. Good and evil, light and dark, Satan or Jesus, gathering or scattering. The fallacy of the problem of middle ground, though, is there is no middle ground. You might think there is, but there's not. You're either with or you're against. You're either scattering or you're gathering. There is no riding the fence. There is no gray area. It's black or white. And Jesus totally states this and he's, he's clear in all of his statings, and we find this in Luke's passage at this point, that are you going to follow Jesus or not? That Luke has written this orderly account so that you'll know what you believe so that you will live it or you won't. I think of Judas at this point, and I'm, I, think, I don't think he's thinking, hey, I'm not going to walk the walk and talk the talk. But yet his heart was filled for his love for money. What are your thoughts focused on? What is your time focused on? What is your money focused on? What is your prayer life? We just learned how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. But are those just words or is that how you live your life? There is no gray area. There is true or false. There is black or white. You are either with or or against Jesus, you're either gathering or scattering souls for all eternity by the profession that comes out of your mouth and the way that you live your life. So I'll give you an example of no middle ground. Okay? Alan says that ostriches can fly. Sherry says that ostriches can't fly. 
Okay, you might know what's true, you might not. That doesn't matter at this point. But there's a truth here. There is no middle ground. I can't say that ostriches can fly sometimes. That's just dumb. They can either fly or they can't fly. Well, the truth is, is they lack keel. K-E-L-L. K-E-E-L, sorry. You say, what's keel? It's the breastbone plate that's necessary for, Diane and you, for flying. They don't have it. They cannot fly. It's impossible for them to fly. There is no middle ground. There's right or wrong, truth or lie, heaven or hell, the devil or Jesus. You cannot serve two masters. You will love one and despise the other, but we don't want to say that. We don't want to say that we're against Jesus. Surely none of us are against Jesus. The crowds weren't against Jesus. They loved Jesus. He was so popular and everything else, but yet they walked away when he said, I am the bread of life. Even his disciples walked away to the point where, where Jesus asked the twelve, are you going to leave also? But Peter made that miraculous declaration that only comes from inspiration from heaven. Where are we going to go? You are the son of the most high. You have the words that lead to eternal life. And so Peter followed. Does that mean he didn't stumble along the way? Oh no, that didn't mean that at all. But it means he set his heart, his mind, on following after his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the things of this world grew strangely dim. So if you think you can listen to God's Word and yet not apply it to your hearts and to your minds so that you live, you're standing on middle ground, which is a fallacy, which is sinking sand. Jesus is clear about it when He speaks on the Sermon on the Mount and says to build, build your house on the firm foundation. You might think you're fine now, but there will be troubles that come in your life probably, and if they don't, okay. So there's so many psalms, read them, about how it looks like the wicked are prospering. But they will all be accountable to God one day. And there is heaven or hell, no middle ground, all based on who is the Savior and Lord of your life. Middle ground winds up collapsing and you wind up into a dark eternity. Are you then with Jesus or against Jesus? And along with that, are you gathering or scattering? You can't leave that part out. Jesus says it. You can't be with Jesus and not gathering. You can't know how to cure cancer and not use it to cure cancer. It, that's just dumb. And if you have the greatest gift of all, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, and the ability to share that, and you don't, then you're just professing with your mouth because your, your heart is far from Jesus. So last week we learned to pray so that we could follow Jesus, so that we could be like Jesus in this world, that we could be His hands and feet when Jesus was not here, so that we would be with Jesus and we would be gathering souls into the kingdom. And it seems like it's been a long time. It's been 2,000 years, but it's just perfect in God's timing because He wants to gather in whoever He wants to gather in into the kingdom, and it's your responsibility to be those hands and feet. And we don't know who it is, so we have to be a witness for everybody, and we have to love everybody, even our enemies, because it might be that we come to our enemy and we show an act of kindness like the Good Samaritan and bring them into the kingdom because of the testimony that we live, because of the compassion that we have, because we live like Christ in this world. And we let the Spirit and the Word guide us and sanctify us into all truth. So here we get to Luke chapter 11, and I'm going to try to cover verses 14 to 32. I'll read that section first. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he drives out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebul. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
We'll see that constantly in the Gospel of Luke and in the Gospel of Matthew, that the kingdom of God is here. And we don't understand that living in a democracy so much. But there is kings and there are kingdoms all throughout the Bible. And the king of this world, the prince of this world, is Satan. And in your sins, you follow him whether you think you are, do or not. But when you've come into the light and Jesus has exposed that and the light has come into you, you no longer live for the king anymore. You are new creations in Christ. The things that you desired before aren't the same. So you can go back in Luke's gospel and think about how you're supposed to love your enemies, how you're supposed to lend even to others without expecting payment in return because the Gentiles do the expect payment in return. But you will live such different lives. And that was back several chapters ago in Luke if you don't remember. You live such different lives, oh, that yeah, you're like that Samaritan. There's no way you can leave that enemy of yours in the ditch to die. You've got to go out and try to help him because you have compassion in your heart for every human being and you have to act upon that compassion. And it's going to cost you time and money and, and everything else, but you don't care because you have compassion, especially for the soul of that human being. Because the, the wisdom of the kingdom of heaven, the keys of the kingdom of heaven have been handed to you. You have the gospel message to present to them that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Are you living that way? <clears throat> Verse 21, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted, and he divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than it was before, at the first. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise at judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at, judgment, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented of the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Middle of the road. In a cup of coffee. You like iced coffee or you like hot coffee? I like iced coffee. Some of you like hot coffee. I don't like hot beverages as much. But who likes lukewarm coffee? It's not good for either. It's only fit to be thrown out, right? It's middle of the road coffee. It's a compromise. It's sitting on the fence. Yeah. That's why Jesus said to the church, he said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, to the angel of the church Laodicea, write, these are the words of the amen, the one that we're supposed to agree with, the faithful and true witness, the one that we're supposed to fix our eyes on, the author and perfecter of our faith, the ruler of God's creation, the great I am, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. And I were, wish you were either one or the other. You can't be middle of the road. It's not gray. It's black or white. It's heaven or hell. It's Satan or it's Jesus. So because you are lukewarm, trying to ride that fence, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Words from Jesus from heaven years after to the church that's following him, those that are supposed to be his hands and feet, and he has these words to write. That because you know in your heart what you should believe, and you know in your mind what you should do, but you fail to do it, or you do it sometimes and you don't do other times, you're just lukewarm and I am about to spit you out. Well, when you spit that cup of coffee out because it's lukewarm, you don't ever drink it back, do you? You pour it out, it's gone. That's the end of it. 
There's no picking it back up. There's no making it hot again. You didn't spit it back in the cup and reheat it in the microwave. It's spit out. It's gone. And Jesus is saying this to the church because they are lukewarm riding the middle of the fence, standing on middle ground, however you want to put it. And his answer is, I am about to. He gives them time to repent. I am about to spit you out of my mouth. I wish you were hot or cold with me or against me. But this middle of the road stuff won't work. A lot of Jesus' followers out of the crowds and out of the disciples tried to stand on middle ground and many of them had turned away. But here in this chapter, we see there are still crowds following Jesus because they still were attracted to Jesus because he performed miracles by the finger of God. We've got to go see who this guy is. He's coming to our region and we've been told he's the, he is the one, the Messiah, the chosen one. He is the Christ. Or who is this guy? Or maybe I need this healed. Whatever reason it was, you wanted to be associated with Jesus until it meant take, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me. That was a couple chapters back. When you get to that point, it kind of makes a difference, doesn't it? After Jesus is teaching with his disciples about prayer, he has an encounter with a demon. That's not coincidence. It's not coincidence Jesus, I mean, Luke wrote this orderly account this way. Paul tells us this in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. We're in spiritual warfare. This is not a game. This is not easy. War is hard. War doesn't take timeouts, anything else. And you need to put on the full armor of God. Keep it on. Not try to put your armor on. Put his armor on. Not put part of it on. Put all of it on. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And the more that you want to stand with Jesus, the more you're going to encounter demon activity in your life. Don't think that you won't. It hasn't changed any. Because if you're trying to do something good for the kingdom, Satan's going to be there with his minions. Probably not Satan himself because you're not that big a person. And Satan is not, can't be everywhere at every time. You read your Bibles on that. I won't go down that rabbit trail. But he's got many, many demons that can be in places. And we've already read that if one's there and goes away, he brings back others. We already read about a legion of demons out there. And the more that you're doing things for God, the more that you're going to be attacked spiritually because we fight a spiritual battle. For you, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Look at all that we're fighting against. And if you're not aware of it and you think things are just fine and dandy, then you all don't have the wisdom. I was going to say something else, but I won't call you a F-O-O-L. <laughs> because we fight a spiritual battle. You belong to Jesus Christ or you don't. You're in the Lord's army or you're not. There is no middle ground. Therefore, because he's wrote all this, put on the full armor of God. There it is again. The battle has been waged. The victory is in Jesus. But you still got to fight the battle. So that when the day, day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. It's amazing here. Paul doesn't tell us to march or anything like that. He just tells us to stand firm. Firmly planted on the foundation of Jesus Christ and nothing else. You just have to withstand. The battle has been won. But the war rages on until we meet Jesus face to face again. And he reigns. Now think back about what Luke wrote about demons and so forth in his gospel already. In chapter 4, Jesus encounters Satan. And he tries to get Jesus to take the easy road to being king that he'll set him up as king. He knows that he is the king of all kings, but follow my way to that instead of God's way. He twists scripture. After that, Jesus goes to Nazareth and he's rejected in his hometown. Then he goes to Capernaum and there's a demon at the church service. Church service. The, the battle rages on. 
And the demon knew that Jesus would destroy all of them. And he was cast out by Jesus' words. Your word, O Lord, is full of truth. It is eternal. Your word stands firm. It is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. It is Jesus here in the words of God. Put into my heart, written on that fleshly heart, meaning that it's pliable, so that I will live it out by the Holy Spirit if I am living as a child of God, if I understand this. At the end of the chapter, Jesus is at Simon's mother-in-law's house and it says he cast out many demons and they cried out, You are the Son of God. Now if they cry that out, I've got to sit here and think to myself, when I cry that out, how am I living? Because the demons left. They knew their fate. And here sometimes I want to sit here and say, I'm saved and I know it. But is my life truly showing it? Am I living it or just professing it? Because the Pharisees professed, the scribes professed, but they were far from their heart being right. And they were against Jesus, it's obvious. But we don't want to say we're against Jesus because we never want to say that. We're for Jesus. But how many Christians do you know, and then take it back to your own self because it's easier to point fingers at someone else, that don't act like Christians. They don't act like Christ. But then, like I said, as soon as you think of those people, examine your own self and make sure that you're living like Christ in this world. Are you a witness for Jesus? Are you a child of God all the time? Or sometimes do you put a foot on middle ground or try to stand totally on middle ground? In Luke chapter 7, people said that Jesus had a demon in him because he spent time with sinners. But yet he was preaching to them the truth. He, was, he came to set the captives free. And his answer back was, but wisdom is proven, proved right by all her children. So if I'm a child of God and wisdom says that I act like Jesus, then that's proof that I belong to Jesus. If I act like the world still, then maybe I should examine myself to see if I really belong to my father, the devil. It's proven by the way that the children live. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus encounters a legion of demons. Remember, there's two men. We don't know what happened to the other man. Luke doesn't tell us about the second man. But we know the one man wants to come with Jesus. And he said, no, your witness field is back here. We don't know if that legion of demons is gone for good, if they're going to come back and tag the man. We know the people don't want Jesus around for whatever reasons, whether it's economy or they're just scared or they just don't want. You know, we don't know. But he's, he is left there. And as we read on, we know that Jesus goes back to that side of the lake again and is accepted. So his one testimony made a difference. He did it. He, 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 de demonic activity, whatever. He kept on being a witness because he was changed. He was not the same. He belonged to Jesus. And he gathered instead of scattering. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus sends out the twelve and gives them authority to cast out demons. I think we see a pattern here about the demonic activity, don't we? Later in the chapter, after the transfiguration, a father asked the church, I'll say that in parentheses again, to cast out a demon out of his son, but they can't. They can't, Jesus says, because they lack the, the, the faith and the prayer, the fasting to do it. They weren't committed to the task. They believed in their heart. They knew they had the power and the authority. But when it came down to a tougher demon, they shrank back from their calling. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 50, when John was saying, <laughs> we're the 12 disciples. There's this other guy casting out demons. Who is he? Jesus said, do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you that there are others out there, whether they're your denomination or what, or whether you know them or not, that are doing the Lord's work. They're in the Lord's army. It's one church with Jesus as the head with many parts. And you can tell they're with you because what they're doing, they're doing works that, that are showing their repentance. And then in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 72. 
doesn't say he gave them authority or power to cast out demons, but when they come back, they were rejoicing because they cast out demons. So they faced the same demonic activity in the witness field. They were told to pray for workers because the, the harvest was great, but the workers are few. And Jesus told them, don't rejoice that, you're, that, you're, that you cast out demons, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Boy, that's a pivotal point. That's one chapter back. Are your names written in heaven? Are you a disciple? Luke keeps getting to this point and then writes basically there's proof in the pudding. You are or you're not. You're either with or you're against. Are you living for Jesus or are you just professing and when something comes along, you'll turn away or, you, or whatever it is. Or God forbid that when the day happens, that house that you think you were building crashes and you were blind leading the blind into a pit of destruction. So here we are in Luke chapter 11. And Jesus casts out a demon from a man that had been mute. And the man begins to speak, and the crowd is amazed. We don't know how long the man has been mute, anything else. And you can't take all muteness and stuff and add it to demonic activity. Don't go off the tangent there. Know that there is demonic activity and, and be aware of it, but not everything is by any means. But the crowd was amazed because they saw another miracle by the finger of God. How many miracles by the finger of God has Jesus performed? And let me say what a miracle is. A miracle is not a sleight of hand or anything else. Go back to the Old Testament and how Pharaoh's sorcerers did things. But then it came to a certain point and they said, this is by the finger of God. Pharaoh, you need to look at this. But by that point, Pharaoh had hardened his heart so much that God hardened his heart. Be careful. So you've seen all these miracles of Jesus. You know for a fact these are done by the finger of God. But you reach the point where you say, they're from Satan. How idiotic. And then the argument that comes up after that, well, it's Satan doing it to cast out on self. Well, that's a stupid tactic, isn't it, for a war that we're waging? I mean, the whole argument here is insane from the outside looking in. But how many times again do we look at someone else and say, boy, you know, I don't know how they can profess to be a Christian. And, oh, wait a minute. Oh, how hard our hearts get and how dark our minds get when we don't listen to God's word when the Holy Spirit pricks us and we try to justify and put off what God's telling us to do but some of them said by Beelzebul the prince of demons he is driving out demons others tested him asking for him for a sign so what do we have here we have a miracle by the finger of God. We have a changed life. We have a testimony. Okay, do we have that? And we have the crowd saying, he's either doing it by Satan's power. We're not denying the miracle. We're denying the authorship of the miracle. Okay, no denying the miracle here. We're not denying the other miracle. Something great is happening. But is this of the devil? People being healed, given their sight. Boy, okay. Uh, he's a deceiver, but he's limited. <laughs> he's not God. He's not equal with Jesus. Don't take that. It, it, so many religions out there, cult religions, say that Jesus is equal with the devil. Jesus is equal maybe with Michael. Maybe. But he's limited in his power. Jesus is the great I am. He is God in the flesh performing miracles so that you'd know that salvation has come to mankind instead of God's wrath. There is a decision to make now before the God's wrath comes upon man who are dead in their sins and trespasses. And all you have to do is believe the greatest thing ever because no one can do the things that they need to do. You'll all fall short in any religion that does that. How much is good enough? What about the one thing I did? There are none righteous, no, not one. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So where is the, where is the power coming from? Who is Jesus? You've got to decide again. Jesus' answer, and the others testing for a sign, we'll get to that in a minute. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. 
And he gives a second example. A house divided against itself will fall. Well, maybe I don't understand the kingdom part. Maybe I'm not enough to that, but I built a house, don't I? Most of us that get married have children, not necessarily, you know, but we build a home. We know what a home is, a house is. We know it's a place of security, but we're not supposed to build up houses, treasures here on earth. We're supposed to look for eternal. We all, whether we know Jesus Christ as our Savior or not, wonder what's going to happen to us when we die. We're all drawn to the answer with a hole in our heart, and the answer is Jesus. But will we accept that or not? So I understand this, and if it's division, which, oh, wait a minute, if I'm doing things sometimes that aren't godly, and I'm doing some things times that are godly, there's division here in my heart again. I'm either with Jesus or, for, or against Jesus. Man, those words are scary. But any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. So your accusation here that you're making is dumb. But like I said, you're so blind in it that you'll make those dumb accusations. I think back now, and I can't give a real example, but like where I had an argument with my wife, and the thing I come out of my mouth that's so dumb, <laughs> but I'm right, so i got to say it. So you know what I'm talking about. I just can't think of the example. I probably could, but I'm not going to admit it. <laughs> But we get so blind and so ignorant there because we want to take our firm stand on what we say we believe and are that we think we're right even when we know we're wrong. So Satan's kingdom will fall, but Satan's kingdom is not divided here. So it's kind of a quandary, but Jesus tells us more about this because he's not divided in his tactics. His tactics are he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's the end of you. That's his job. Don't think that this changed any. It hasn't changed since the beginning. He's the great deceiver. It won't change until Jesus reigns. There's no middle ground. We're facing a battle. We're with one or the other. You're building a house. It's part of a kingdom. What's going to happen to this house? Is it going to lie in ruin or not? Do you understand this? Well, let's read on. Oh, let's go to Matthew first and look at one of Jesus' words. At the end of the Sermon of the Mount, the very last thing Jesus said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, a hearer and a doer, not a hearer only, puts them into practice. That means regular routine. Sure, you might fall and fail some of the time again, but you're, you're on the Lord's team. You're in His army. You're doing what you should be doing. It's your heart's focus. You can pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You can say, Lord, help me to deny myself so I can take up my cross and follow after Jesus. He's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had a foundation on the rock. Complete opposite. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice. There is the difference. They hear the words, but don't put in them into the regular practice of their life. They're like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Thinking back about Judas at this time and where we are and Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, how many times did his thoughts go from here and following Jesus to what if I betrayed him and this money and what I could get and everything else? There's the way, the truth, and the life, and anything off of that path is off the path. And the further we get off that path, the further we get away. And we don't realize it and don't realize it till we're stuck in the mud and the mire. But all we've got to do, like the, the prodigal son, is get up and go back to the Father. When Jesus had finished saying these things, I'm still in Matthew chapter 6, the crowds were amazed at His teaching. Do you see a pattern here? The crowds are always amazed at the teaching that Jesus has, at His authority, at His power, at everything else. But when it comes down to, will you deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Me, and it's only Me, then there's division. Because I think I can stand on middle ground and I'll be okay. But Jesus makes it clear here in Luke's Gospel that you won't be Okay. It's a scary statement, but it's a loving statement so much too. 
If you want to follow me, you've got to do it. I, you can't have any other gods before me. I've got to be everything in your life. And if I'm Lord of all, don't you dare worry. I will return. I have gone to prepare a place for you, for you so that where I am, you may be also. Wow, the peace that surpasses all understanding. The crowds were amazed, verse 29, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Okay, back to Luke chapter 11 because the teachers of the law is here with the crowd again. They say they're righteous. They're the guides of the people, but yet they're blind leading the blind because they won't admit. They think their works of righteousness are good enough or their heritage is good enough or whatever it is instead of just knowing that I'm a sinner and that the only way that I can be saved is by God's grace. The Old Testament points to that, all the sacrificial system, everything else. The law, like Paul said, he got through nine commandments till he hit thou shalt not covet. And then he said, oh, I'm guilty. I don't know how he got to number 10 before he said it, but he said if it wasn't for that commandment. Luke chapter 11, verse 18. If Satan is divided against himself, so here's our king of this worldly kingdom. How can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Jesus is reinforcing the statement that you just made is ludicrous. Don't take it any deeper than that because we know from, from Scripture that Satan is not divided. He knows what his agenda is and it is to destroy you. But Jesus says if you're using this argument, that is a ludicrous argument argument and you know it because you're trying to take your stand on middle ground I say this because you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub now if I do drive out demons by Beelzebub let me say it to you a different way by whom then do your followers drive them out so if you wouldn't believe the first argument, because this is to bring you to salvation, not to bring you away from salvation, it's to, for you to realize who Jesus Christ is, even though you've made accusations that, that he's doing things by the devil's power. If I drive out demons, and they're by the finger of God, who do your guys that you put your trust and faith in? How do you know they're not doing it by the prince of demons' power? If, if I'm doing it, certainly some of them are. Oh boy, now you're really confused, aren't you? So then they'll be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, which is a conclusion you've got to come to with all the, the, the things that's happened so far in all this, all the miracles that's been performed. And, and John said that if he wrote down all the signs and wonders that Jesus performed, they, he couldn't write them all. If I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So now I've got to decide whose kingdom am I in? Whose side am I on? Who am I fighting this battle for? Who is my commander in chief? Who am I fixing my eyes on and taking my instructions from? And who am I gathering for? And who am I scattering for? Because I'm either with Jesus and gathering in the kingdom or again on the opposite side means I'm with Satan and I'm gathering for hell. For an eternity of destruction. I don't like to think of it that way, but that's the truth. It's black or white. I'm either with Jesus and gathering for him or I'm scattering, which means they're going to hell because they will die in their sins. And I've had a part to play in this. Because I'm Jesus' hands and feet, His disciple. I can't say that I'm just a Christian and not live as a disciple. Whose kingdom are you a child of? Are you with Jesus or against Jesus? And are you gathering for His kingdom or scattering into Satan's kingdom? So Jesus goes on to say in verse 21, when a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. That's talking about the devil. You, you were there, you were His, you belong to Him. Scripture's clear about that. But here's the complete opposite again. When someone's stronger, you don't ever have anything to worry about. Jesus just said, I am stronger than Satan. He's strong, He's powerful, but you can say to the devil, flee from you and He will flee from you. 
You can cast out demons in the name of Jesus if you realize that you can and it's in God's will that you do that. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor. That's why I told us what Paul said in, in Ephesians 6. He takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides his plunder. If we have God's armor on and Satan has been ripped of his armor, what's going to happen to Satan? <laughs> we know his outcome. The demons knew his outcome. He said, you are the son of God. Do you understand all this? And he divides up his plunder. The things that he had in his army, his weapons, his people, his forces, now belong to another team, to another kingdom, to Jesus. Which kingdom do you belong to? Okay, well, that's where it ends, right? No, nope. here's the next verse. Whoever is not with me is against me. Very next verse. Black or white, no middle ground. Here it is. He said all these things. He's put the argument out there. I mean, even scholars that don't believe in Jesus, Jesus was a dynamic debater and all this and his, his parables and stories had so much wisdom and intellect. Well, yeah, of course they did because he's God. But you don't understand that the finger of God is behind the miracles and the power of God because Jesus is God. But yet he states it clearly that he is. And you either accept it or you don't. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. You're gathering with Jesus or you're not with Jesus. You belong to the devil and you scatter. Do you understand this? There's no middle ground. Now Jesus goes on to tell even more about this spiritual warfare that we'll face. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Why does it not, seek, why does it not find rest? Because it's here to torment us and fight for the devil's plans to destroy you, obtain your soul for all eternity in hell. That's the war that we're raging. It doesn't find rest because that's its objective. It's not going to stop until they're bound away for all eternity and you don't have to worry about anything anymore. And then we can say on top of that there will be no death, no suffering, no, no pain. That's the physical things. But it does not find any. Then what does it say? And so I've got to go back to those legion of demons. If they weren't cast out for good and there's nothing to imply they did, man, they came back on that man strong. <laughs> but yet he still was a witness because he told a legion of them, 6,000 demons maybe, that came back to attack him. Oh, well, they brought seven more. <laughs> maybe there was 42,000 that came back to attack this man. And he's saying, in Jesus' name, get out of here. 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 Do you know Jesus? He changed my life. Get out of here, demon. Get out of here, demon. In Jesus' name. I don't know. I'm just putting that as a picture. I don't know. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it found the house swept and clean and put in order. It looks good. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. They go back into that house and take up residence there. We're not talking about a physical house, guys. We're talking about your soul. And the final condition of that person, so we're clear, is worse than the first. No matter what you do to sweep out your house, if you don't fill it with Jesus and nothing but Jesus, then there's still stuff in the corners that can creep up. And Jesus said, I will not leave you alone. I will send the Comforter to be with you. And, and He would be with us always. No gray area, no middle ground. As Jesus was saying this, verse 27, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave birth and nursed you. Strange statement right here, but okay. True statement. And something that in many religions, again, has gone way off the rails. <laughs> Mary is no holier than you are. You're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ, by your faith in Him, and you're made holy. 
She is blessed and will be, ta will be talked about because she bore, I can't even imagine all that. But Jesus said, he didn't deny that, he said, blessed rather are those, if you think how blessed Mary is, that she got to carry uh, the child of God, don't put any deity on her or anything else because there's none. But if you think, man, how blessed is she, Jesus says, she doesn't deny that she is, he says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. If you hear God's word and obey it, you're more blessed than Mary, the mother of Jesus, for that deed that happened, that thing that happened in her life. She's blessed just the same as you for her faith. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus said that the farmer had come to sow his seed and that fell on noble hearts would produce a crop. After that, he says, you can't hide it. That would be just foolish. Then his physical mother tries to come see him and he says this to the, to the people that say that your mother and brothers are coming to see you. He says, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Luke has already wrote that in chapter 8. The words that Jesus says now echo that again. Blessed rather are those who hear the words of God and obey it. You can't just profess Christ and not live Christ. There is no middle ground. Verse 29, as the crowds increased, so they're increasing even more because they've seen this miracle that some are claiming by, are by the finger of God and others are, are saying by, are by Satan's power and then some are just trying to test him. Jesus says this, this is a wicked generation. Is that how you like to think of yourself? If you're trying to stand on middle ground, that's where you are clear from this story scary because it asks for a sign remember in the beginning we have those that claim that this is Satan's power or others say this is a sign okay so where does that put me in this story oh yeah God if you'd only I am a Christian already I'm not the one crying out for Christ this is an example <laughs> and I'm crying out God because you haven't answered my prayers this way give me a sign Really? The sign of Jesus Christ on the cross dying for your sins and raising again to life in three days wasn't good enough? Then any answer to your prayer is not going to have you change your mind. You're either going to be with me or against me. You can take it back to the person who's not professing to be saved yet. Oh Lord, if you'll only show yourself in this way. We've got the sign that surpasses all other signs and wonders. A man named Jesus Christ of Nazareth was crucified and came back to life. And no one can deny that. There is no body found. There is an empty tomb. No one dis disputes it. We don't know what happened. He swooned whatever things you want to come up with. And it's different than any other religion because those, their, their leaders are dead and gone. So if you don't accept that sign, this is a wicked generation that asked for a sign. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. The demon left. The man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said it was by Beelzebub, and others tested him asking for a sign. That's the crowd. We don't know who got saved that day. But none of you, none will be given except the sign of Jonah, verse 30, for, the, for as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. So I've got to take myself to, to Jonah, and you've got to study God's Word. Jonah was a messenger sent to Nineveh, one of the most wicked cities in the world. His, his message was what? <laughs> Eight words, repent or die, basically. Because destruction's coming in 40 days. I might have it written somewhere here, but I don't know where it's at right in a second. That's it. And they repented in sackcloth and ashes because they didn't want to die. They didn't want God's destruction coming upon him. You don't even know anything else about the story or anything, but as you study more, you can put more into the story. And if Jesus was the same sign to this generation, what do they need to do? Repent and turn to God. That's it. That's all you've got to do. Here's the point. If you're a follower of Jesus already, you better get serious about doing it. If you're not, all you've got to do is repent and turn to God. 
And know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah because He's doing miracles by the finger of God. The kingdom of God is at hand because God's one and only Son has come to this world to die for your sins and if you believe in Him, you will have eternal life and never perish. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. And the Son of Man has so many more implications. Let's give another example though, Jesus says. The Queen of the South will rise at judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom and now someone greater than Solomon is here. Queen of Sheba came and gave Solomon all these gifts because she heard of all of his wisdom that he had. And she believed. And she will rise up at the end at judgment with the generation from this day that accepted Jesus and they will condemn you because someone greater than Solomon's wisdom is here. As, a, as an Israelite, you wanted to pursue wisdom and you wanted shalom, peace that surpassed all understanding. Here is the wisdom of all wisdom standing before you, the wisdom of God because Jesus is God. It is foolish to ask for a sign. It's foolish to say that this wisdom comes from the devil. Verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. Same thing. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now someone greater than Jonah is here. All you've got to do is repent. So where are you at in this story today? Is there anything you need to repent of? And do you need to turn to Jesus for the very first time? Do you need to turn back to Jesus? Is He your Lord of everything? We're to the end of this section of Scripture. No, we're not. I just didn't read you the next verse when I started. Because the next verse is, No one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden or under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in may see the light. How stupid would we be to light a lamp and then hide it? Because not only would the room be dark for us, but it'd be room, the room would be dark for everyone who lived in our household for our children that God has blessed us with, the heritage with, for our spouse that God has blessed us with, that He gave us the gift of marriage and the blessing of children before sin came into this world. Who in the world would light a lamp for their family to see and build a house that way? No one. That is the most foolish thing that you could possibly do if you've been given the light and hide it for whatever reason. You're either with Jesus or you're against Jesus. You're either building a foundation on solid ground or you're not. Jesus is my Lord. I will follow Him. And guess what? He'll make me into a fisher of men. I will gather. It won't be any of my works of righteousness. It won't be my power. I was talking to somebody yesterday and he said, and this came up out of the blue. <laughs> Not something I was talking He said, I just don't know how I would be if I saw my family and everything facing a firing squad. He said, I just, I'm afraid that I would denounce Jesus. I said, you would. But if the Holy Spirit's living in you, He will give you the words to say then. I said, go look at Scripture. Go look at Stephen. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I said, because you don't have that power in you. You don't. But the power is in you because of Jesus Christ if you're a child of God. And you don't have to worry about professing Jesus or not under any circumstances. And he said, you know, you're right. I haven't thought of it that way. Is Jesus your Lord of all? If He is, you will be gathering for the kingdom. And that's where I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that this church does that, that we gather our families into that, that we're a light to our community because that's the most important thing that we can do is being called a Christian. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the words of Jesus Christ. We pray, thank you that you send your spirit, Lord, to seal us for that day and to empower us, Lord. Help us to be hungry for righteousness, to be hungry for your word, Lord. May the spirit give us gifts. May the spirit uh, give us fruits of the spirit as we walk in step with the spirit. And Lord, where we fall, help us to realize to to turn our, our eyes to Jesus, Lord, and get ourselves up out of the mire by His power and might, not by our power and might, to live for the kingdom of God so that we will be gathering, Father. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness because Your words say that You are faithful and true to do that. 
we thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve in the Lord's army. And Lord, help, to make, help make us aware of the spiritual battle we face rather than fixing our eyes on the physical things. Lord, I thank you for this church. I pray for unity in the body and the spirit of this church. Lord, and I pray for each and every one here, their families, their friends. Lord, I pray that, that Satan and his forces are bound in the name of Jesus Christ from our homes, Lord, as we do shine our lights. Lord, increase the intensity of our lights to be an example to all those that we encounter. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.